Okay, so the general field is in unmanned air vehicles or UAVs, and another project is on humanoids, which are kind of uh, people like robots. And uh, for UAVs, they've become very popular. Um, things like Predator or Global Hawk, uh, they fly high in the sky and they have a lot of reconnaissance roles, uh, just like last October. Uh, because of all the forest fires in Southern California, they provided a lot of the first responders with information about where the fire is going. But um, uh, my particular interest in UAVs is uh, bird-sized airplanes that could fly in a forest or in and around a building or maybe through caves and tunnels. And I came about this um, partly because of 9-11, okay. Um, we heard that there was a, a real need uh, for disaster mitigation um, to be able to provide some assets to do search and rescue. So if we can design these type of robots that can fly in and around a building or through a forest or cave and tunnel, it would really have an impact. Um, the thing is that I've always been fascinated by things like uh, airplanes, robots, and that's how my, you know, that's how, why I entered engineering in the first place. But it was until 9-11 that I realized that these curiosities and interests could actually have a social impact. And so we started to design these type of, you know, flying robots. Um, also after Katrina hit, uh, we realized, yes, we could use these to help with search and rescue. Uh, exploration, building inspection, uh, and that sort of sort of uh, tasks. I can tell you some of the things I've learned um, that students can be very passionate about their work. Um, after 9/11 hit, um, and the idea that we can actually use robots to actually help and make a difference. Um, the amount of passion and dedication that my students would put into designing these type of things uh, I've never seen. Um, so be able to tap into that type of energy and enthusiasm uh, was very important. So I learned that. Um, I also learned to really appreciate nature. Um, you know, we do our best to try to build something mechanically, but we're still very far off from building anything like a bird or even something simple, much simpler like a, a little insect. Um, so an appreciation of how nature could, uh, has the power supplies for this, the maneuverability, um, that's been really fascinating. But uh, through these type of experiments, we get a glimpse at, at what nature and, and her secrets. Um, and by taking some of that insight um, we can actually build better machines. This research is really important um, because a lot of it was inspired um, from the events of 9-11 and Hurricane Katrina. Um, a lot of the curiosities and interests that we had, we realized that we can make a contribution to helping the first responders. We could design robots that can fly inside buildings or caves and tunnels where it's very dangerous and dirty for, uh, for people. So to take them out of harm's way, we could design robots that can go inside there, see if there are any uh, casualties or victims in a search and rescue effort. Uh, we could also do maybe inspection. Is there a chemical release in that area? is a building about to collapse, by sending a robot there, we're, we, we just don't have to send as many people in there. So uh, that's why we think it's important, and that's why we think it has huge societal con you know, issues. I think for students, many people are just fascinated with flight, you know, things flying. Um, people are also very fascinated about robots, okay? And so they just seem to have a very natural uh, appeal to them and could uh, really spark um, a person's, a student's imagination. Okay, I wish I could build a robot that can do X, Y, Z.
or I wish I could build a robot that flies and does these type of tasks. Okay. Uh, in terms of industries, um, there's huge amount of benefits that come out of flying robots, uh, providing surveillance data, helping GPS companies to map the Earth better, uh, uh, airplanes that could fly in Antarctica where you don't want to fly pilots for long periods of time. They can remotely fly like a robot and collect data and map out you know, uh, what's going on, maybe even detect uh, the patterns of global warming. Um, we could track and monitor nature, things like schools of fish. Um, Any time where you don't want to put a pilot uh, flying for many, many hours, uh, can we do it robotically? Okay. Uh, there's a huge amount of congressional support for this as well. Um, because the aerospace industry provides jobs. Um, we find that the Europeans are very aggressive in developing unmanned vehicles because in their philosophy, whoever designs unmanned vehicles best are going to be the aerospace global leaders in the 21st century. So here in the United States, we have this, um, we're at a cusp where we could capture this uh, and be aerospace leaders or we can lose this market. So UAVs has, has that potential. And for teachers, of course, it's kind of very easy to uh, leverage the, the imagination of flight and, and build on what media has presented us about uh, robots. It's a very interesting topic. And so uh, I think it just lends very well for, for teaching as well. I kind of chuckle because uh, actually I was discouraged to go into science. Um, my high school science teacher uh, said I could never make it as a scientist or an engineer. Uh, I uh, went to my guidance counselor and I took those assessment tests and it turned out that I'd be a perfect farmer. Okay, uh, But I had a passion. I wanted to design airplanes. I, I loved uh, flying and um, when I told my science teacher that's what I wanted to do, uh, it broke my heart uh, when he said, you'll never make it. So I got rebellious, and I said, I'm going to show and prove to him that I can. And um, yeah, all my poor math scores and the bad physics and bad study habits that I had uh, changed. And slowly, um, I did better and better. and. Uh, that's how I got to be a scientist today. I think uh, it also really helped that um, I took advantage of a lot of the books that were out there. I didn't, I realized it wasn't about me. Sometimes the teacher just has a hard time explaining it. it my classmates can understand it, but I didn't. But that never stopped me from looking at another book and say, hey, I understand it now. Maybe not the way my teacher explained it, but I, I was able to. And it was kind of that self-learning that has, was able to carry me from ninth grade through 10th grade, then to college, to grad school. So um, yeah, I guess that's how it came about. In terms of unmanned vehicles, they do an excellent job right now of surveillance. Put a camera on there, you can see what's going on. But we got to take it to the next level, okay? Uh, it's great that you can monitor a forest fire, okay? But do something about the forest fire, okay? Could you, these aircraft pick up fire retardant or water, fly to the forest, drop it, do that multiple times? We'd want a robot to do that because putting a pilot, it's just very tedious, okay? Uh, how about... Uh, transporting cargo internationally. So I heard that FedEx and other courier companies are really looking into these technologies uh, to be able to transport uh, cheaply and, and very quickly. So uh, the technologies that are involved to make this safe, uh, very robust, that they won't fail in all weather, um, you know, day and night, uh, there, there are a lot of challenging issues and these are questions that need to be tackled. Um, on the other front, looking at humanoids, um, uh, it, it's fascinating to hear um, how few American students travel abroad. 
Uh, I heard a statistic that uh, over 80% of European students travel outside of Europe to explore the world during their studies. Uh, I heard that less than 3% of engineering students uh, travel outside, outside of North America. So as a result, they have a very myopic, very narrow uh, view of what's going on in the world around them. Humanoid robots are the ones that look like you know, humans, um, like C-3PO in Star Wars. Um, clearly, the best ones are made in Asia. Um, and I think as American students want to know more about robots, they're going to gravitate to places like in Asia. And so we're right now building these partnerships with Asian countries like Korea, Japan, and China to really understand their robots, bring them to America. I think this is critical because not since the Apollo space program has there been such an excitement for science and engineering. Um, the Apollo space program raised an entire generation, or possibly even two generations, of engineers that not just only got you know man to the moon, but designed uh, super materials, uh, new choir engines, uh, new clothing, uh, lots of things that have affected our our life, quality of life. Okay. Um, Japan, Korea, China, robots are their Apollo space program. Um, they, will, they say uh, they will not be number two to anyone. And so we, they have a whole generation, and they have the government backing with budgets that are probably eight to ten times science dollars than the United States has uh, to develop robots. And these are the people that are going to design the next MP3 players, the next hybrid vehicles, uh, the next uh, lightweight batteries for your cell phones. Uh, but meanwhile, engineering and science enrollments in this country are just plummeting. Um, and there's a need to kind of recapture that. Okay? And I think they can be captured in a couple of ways. You know, one of them... Again, robots just seem to have a natural appeal, okay? Uh, and the second is to have our students have global experiences. Uh, I think uh, when students go travel, I think everybody agrees, once you travel, your eyes kind of open up. And by getting them to leave America to experience what the world has um, makes them see their country and their context uh, with a different perspective and renewed passion. So that's why we're partnering up with some Asian um, you know, uh, collaborators to bring humanoids to America and uh, apply America's expertise in artificial intelligence to make these robots smarter and to do very useful and practical applications. The helicopter itself is capable to fly by itself. It's basically a flying robot. So all we have to do is give it the instructions, it's time to take off. It'll fly up to the designated altitude. We give it GPS information, and it'll fly the coordinates of the path it needs to follow. So we can have a camera or a similar sensor mounted on the front of the helicopter. It'll per perform a surveillance mission and be able to return all the important data. If there's some sort of danger, if there's some sort of a chemical spill, we can send this system out to that location, identify if there's anyone there who's injured, and be able to bring them uh, aid by identifying their location and reporting that to someone who's ready to help. In designing unmanned air vehicles or aerial robots, um, the common practice is to build something, take it outdoors, fly it, and if it doesn't fly, it'll crash. Okay, and they'll repeat that cycle. It's very expensive, it can be dangerous, and it it really takes a lot of time away from the actual design and testing. But um, we came up with this idea of uh, kind of an indoor test and evaluation test rig. You can see over here we have a model railroad scale of an area that we would typically like to fly in. And you can see that we have buildings, we have forests, we have structures 
that an aircraft could possibly collide in. By doing a lot of the testing in this rig, we're able to rapidly um, close that design loop. We have lights so we can adjust for lighting. We can make it a very bright sunny day or a moonless night. We also have fog machines to create fog. So if you're flying in that type of environment, we can also implement rain. So by creating these type of environments, uh, we could test for these, whereas in traditional practice, it would be very risky to fly a robotic aircraft in the rain or in the fog. And so here, uh, for public safety, uh, for rapidly closing the design loop, uh, this rig has really given us an advantage to build aircraft like these. This metal structure over here can move uh, in and out, sideways, up and down. It could roll, pitch, and yaw, just like a real airplane would. And you can imagine that you had a camera on that flying robot. Well, we can move uh, this uh, arm to fly down really low and actually capture what the view of the aircraft would be. Imagine an airplane that would be flying through the forest. It might want to do a surveillance route around the buildings. And by doing that, it has to fly autonomously like a robot and not hit anything. So uh, by practicing at this scale, coming up with a solution, we then could put it on a real robotic aircraft. We could then go to the real site outdoors. And because we tested for all of it, it will, uh, design, it will fly accordingly. This is our first generation vehicle. It's a 300cc ATV. The switch is over here. Um, you flip it once, it's into GPS mode. Flip it back and drive it normally. This took um, four undergraduate students nine months to design and complete. And those lessons were uh, evolved into the second generation vehicle, which is a 90cc ATV. Again, same idea. Flip the switch, it's under GPS mode, and flip it back then driver could drive it normally. And uh, this took about three students three months to do. These lessons learned went into this smaller electric ATV, which we use for public audiences and reaching out to the communities, to parents, uh, to kids. It's a very similar philosophy. Um, the idea is that you could drive this under GPS mode. You can see that you have a computer back here and camera as well as a laser rangefinder.